Uh, in this episode of Investors and Operators, I meet with Brian Bank, who does strategy and client development for the Investment Funds Group at Kirkland and Ellis. Brian, can you please give a little bit of background on your story and kind of how, to, how you got to where you're at and what you do at Kirkland? And then we're going to dive into some of these topics. So this is why people need to listen. We're going to be talking about trends in fundraising, annual meeting trends, fundraising mistakes for first-time managers, and a couple of other topics. Brian, over to you. Great, thanks. Appreciate it. So I am part of the investment funds group at Kirkland and Ellis, which is by far the largest funds formation practice in the industry. We've got about 450 lawyers. Uh, we've got over 800 clients. And all we do and all we think about is fund formation from emerging manager to established manager, as well as liquidity solutions, secondaries, continuation funds, end of life solutions for our clients. We have tax and regulatory partners as well as uh, part of this group. So it's a fully integrated team. I am not a lawyer. I spent 16 years as an institutional limited partner investing across all asset classes and then a few years as a placement agent. And I came to Kirkland about five years ago with the very specific job description of help our clients however you can. And what that means is I spent a lot of my time from a strategy, uh, both strategic as well as tactical approach to improving fundraising, improving investor relations, expediting the process, broadening relationships, helping make introductions to service providers, whether it's consultants, whether it's auditors, accountants, whether it's placement agents. The one thing that I generally won't do is pick up the phone and call LPs on behalf of clients. We don't have a broker dealer and that's just not a not in the scope of uh, what we do there are two others who do what i do at kirkland and it's a uh, really unique very fun job well i think what's also interesting is that you've been on the lp side you've been on the placement agent side you've seen this from another angles and one of the things i've appreciated about our conversations is like the the quality of like the pulse you have on the market and because you're talking to gps and you know all day every day seeing what works from an annual meeting perspective, seeing what works from fundraising perspective, you know, and you just have a really interesting pulse on the market. So let's kind of dive into uh, fundraising trends that you are seeing this year. And I think it's interesting to point out the context that this is at the end of, you know, two really difficult years working virtually, trying to fundraise virtually, and then last year's like, okay, now we can go in person. And then we're coming back and like, what are we actually doing? In person, virtual, hybrid for our fundraising and for our annual meetings. Uh, so that's some of the context, but can you kind of share what are some of the key trends you are seeing with fundraising in 2022? And what are some specific things that GPs need to think about? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest trend is it is as active as it's ever been. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's been a few starts and stops with regards to in-person meetings and getting on the road and removing the virtual nature. I think the reality, though, is that we will remain virtual for the most part for the foreseeable future from a fundraising perspective. I think that LPs have become very comfortable doing diligence, having the initial conversations and actually several rounds of conversations with GPs on the virtual approach through Zoom, through Microsoft Teams, et cetera. S secondly, it's beneficial from the GP's perspective, frankly. It saves a ton of money from a travel perspective. But more importantly, logistically, it's much easier to set a schedule. LPs can, you don't have to worry about when someone's available, when multiple members of, a, of an LP team are available. You can often have more participants. You can have almost the entirety of an investment committee participate in multiple meetings. Whereas, you know, two years ago, pre-COVID, you know, it would take weeks to schedule the appropriate team members and make sure that they were available to come in. Um, placement agents are still an integral part of the process as far as I'm concerned. And they are well suited to help identify who the appropriate LPs are, who the people at the LP institution 
are that you should talk to. The last thing you want to do is talk to an infrastructure person when you're selling your growth equity fund um, or, you know, be in touch with the hedge fund person if, in fact, it's a venture capital strategy. So, I mean, as far as trends go, it's going to be busy. Uh, LPs are certainly actively deploying capital. It's definitely worth mentioning that 2022 is expected to be a year of re-ups, and it's going to be very challenging for people to realize new commitments if they haven't had an existing relationship with the GP before. Most large funds, as most industry participants are aware, are coming to market faster. They're coming to market with larger funds. And as a result, LPs pro ratas are getting larger. LPs are you know, trying their best to do follow-on due diligence, do the work that they need to do to get their signatures in place for a new commitment or for a re-up. So there's very little space based on the conversations I've had with LPs, placement agents, and GPs for new relationships. Not to say that they're not going to happen, but very few. So let's dive into that part on emerging managers who do want to form new relationships. If they are going to do it, what should they be doing to differentiate themselves to LPs? Um, How do they need to be doing things practically different? Like, where are some specifics? Like, you guys need to do this. You don't need to be doing that. How can they get that attention? Really good question. I mean, differentiation is is the name of the game, and it's really challenging, particularly when you're doing it virtually. Um, You know, you can do... One, one thing that I advise every client of mine, whether it's an emerging manager and existing manager, is to present as many clear case studies as possible. Give tangible examples for LPs to understand your strategy. Make sure that the examples are right down the middle of the fairway of the strategy that you're trying to express to your client or to the, to the LPs. Um, and dummy everything down. Don't make assumptions that the audience is sophisticated. Don't make assumptions that they understand the strategy, as well as recognize the fact that they've probably had 20 other meetings within the past month with funds that sound very similar to yours. So, you know, it's critical. Well, I, I think that's going back on that second point that you made on the dummy, you know, dummy everything down. It makes me think about uh, pitches that startups do in the venture ecosystem. Absolutely. They're so simple and they're intentionally simple. And I think it's because our industry comes from investment banking and you have to do a 75 page SIM and you have size 10 font and you know more information is better. But actually what I'm gathering from you, it's the exact opposite. Right. Make it simple so they can focus on the essence of who you are, how you're different and it focuses on the conversation. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I think that the reality is, is that um, LPs see a ton of different things. They need to understand very clearly what your strategy is. The case study should be memorable, but most importantly, it's important that the person that the GP is pitching is, is positioned to champion them internally. The last thing that you want to do is develop a rapport with someone, but have that person then walk away and be unable to explain what that strategy was. Why was that team so differentiated? What were the great case studies? You know, 25 examples of prefab manufacturing businesses or, you know, very technical subjects are tough to sell internally, are tough to, you know, be able to explain to others within your investment committee. So if you can provide very clear examples of you know, investments that you made, how the investment was sourced. The term differentiation, the term proprietary are terms that are very overused in the industry. Yeah. Every emerging manager in their deck will have differentiated strategy, proprietary deal flow. The reality is nothing's differentiated and nothing is proprietary. If it truly is, explain in your case study how it's unique. This is a team that I met 
15 years ago and I've been developing a relationship with. This was the, you know, the, the uh, factory floor manager that I worked with 15 years ago who yep. has since been at seven other factories and understands, you know, floor management better than anyone else yeah. understands. And, and to that point of the 15 years, market. and to the point of the 15 years ago, here's how it's repeatable. Here's yeah. how it's not a one-off. I'm a great networker. I found this. And I really want to go back to the other point, which was super critical. And that is avoid the message being lost in the telephone game because your point of contact has to sell internally. So give your internal salesperson the tools to sell internally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other, and, and you know, related to that is try to make sure that your strategy and your terms, frankly, are in the middle of the fairway. You don't want to have to have your champion explain why the terms are different. Why is this a 17 year fund versus a 10 year fund? Why is the GP commit, you know, a point versus two points? Why are, you know, why are you doing a modified waterfall? Um, so now, are, are, you know, are you saying that because, are you saying to clarify in the materials and justify it so there's not lost in translation? Or are you saying be market, don't play both. around, don't play a game? Okay. Both. LPs generally look for reasons to say no as opposed to reasons to say yes. And it's very easy and it's a quicker process if there are these anomalies, things that they just don't seem to make sense that aren't in the middle of the fairway, that aren't market terms. So try to eliminate those. Try to just stay, you know, stay focused on what everyone else is taking, is everyone else is used to seeing and enable, again, try to enable, position yourself in the seat of the person that you're talking to. They want to present to their colleagues the best GPs that they can. They don't want to appear to be, you know, missing good opportunities, uh, but they also need to be able to answer all the questions that that their colleagues are going to raise. Why are these guys good? Why is Jordan better than Brian? What is it that you know he's done in the past that differentiates him from the other fifteen middle market buyout funds that we talked to in the last six weeks? To to what extent do you think that uh, GPs especially ones who they're, where there's a new relationship with potential LPs and emerging managers. Uh, for the conversations you have, to what extent do you feel that emerging managers are realistic about who they are, who they compete against, and how they're different? For example, listen, listen there are lots of industrial-focused private equity firms. Right, right. It's not really that different. Or yeah, how I many... Go ahead. By nature, anyone who's launching their own firm feels confident that they're going to get to get across the finish line and feels that they are differentiated, feels that they have a really interesting story. Otherwise, they're going to stay put. You know, it's, it's a really tough step to leave a very established brand, uh, an established firm to go and launch your own. It's a tough conversation to have at home. I'm going to give up my very, very lucrative salary. I'm going to probably walk away from some carried interest. And I'm not going to get paid for the next two years. Oh, and by the way, for the first time truly in my life, I'm going to be rejected more than I've been accepted. Uh, I mean, again, think about these individuals. It could go back as far as, you know, elementary school, best private schools, best private high schools, best universities, best jobs, best banking jobs, best private equity firms. Now you're going out and launching a fund and you're going to get a 95% rejection rate. It's really challenging. So, I mean, I think to your point, everyone who takes this leap has to have that level of confidence. And if you don't think you can get across the finish line, don't do it because LPs will see through it. You need to build your own confidence. You need to appreciate that this is going to probably be an 18 to 24 month fundraise process between pre-marketing and then actually once you launch. And as, as you know, Jordan, once you have that first close, that's when the clock actually starts ticking. You have generally 12 months from that first close. So it's a very lengthy process. You need to build a team. You need to have confidence that your teammates and colleagues have that same conviction, have that same confidence, and have that same, you know, 
longevity are able and willing to wait for, you know, maybe 24 months before they get that first, you know, close or that first capital call comes through where they can pay themselves for the first time. Yep. And it's, it's so fascinating, just whether you're raising a $250 million fund or you're us and you're like, you're like a five person firm, the pain of that discussion with your family, like, listen, oh. it's going to get bad. And I think what we realized is like, we didn't know how bad it was going to get. Yeah. And there's well, probably the like, news, I mean, the good news in this environment actually is that you're at least not on the road. So, you know, back in the day, you know, the, the day two years ago, you were having that conversation. Oh, and then by the way, I'm hitting the road for, you know, 75% of the time I'm going to be away from family. And generally people who are launching these firms are in their early, early to mid forties. So they have kids. It's not that the kids are out of home, out of school. They have young kids. They have kids in elementary and junior high school. So it's, it's, it's a sacrifice to be on the road all that time. Um, what are, now what are in the, the key- virtual environment, at least you're, you're not necessarily on the planes that much. That might be a good or bad thing (laughs) if you want to get away. (laughs) Um, But it's one of the key lessons that we learned in starting our first business, Debt Maven, five years ago, is that uh, we were not communicating on a regular basis, just like, here's where we're at with the business. And emerging managers, you know, need to have that discussion, I think. Uh, you know, from the one of the less big mistakes that we made is not communicating with our partner. It's not just, hey, I'll, you know, I'll see you when I come home and, and I'm back at it again or I'm back on the road Monday through Thursday fundraising. It's having that structured discussions with your partner at home of here's where we're at because we're in this together. I gave up how much money on the table. We're going through this. Right. And we might have that discussion like in the first couple of months, but making sure that it's quarterly at least or monthly or nightly or nightly. (laughs) I mean, honestly, it's, I mean, I think people will are quicker to celebrate, you know, victories. You get that big ticket written, you get that consultant who puts you on the platform, you get the influential LP who agrees to anchor you and write a big check. Obviously everyone at the home is going to see that happiness. Everyone's going to see that mood, but you know, to my earlier comment, time and time again, the rejections are, you know, let's keep, keep in touch, keep me in the loop. Let's talk in six weeks. I don't have capacity right now, but I'm going to have capacity in 2023. You know, those are the, those are the, the, the deflating conversations. And, you know, it's really important to your point to, you know, to have those discussions at home, to have those discussions with your colleagues, even, and your colleagues, families. I mean, I advise clients and I think it's just good practice to, consider the family as a broader group of people. I mean, knowing I used to, I was a consultant over 25 years ago. I often said that, you know, the job interview, the most important piece was how is someone going to work at three o'clock in the morning for the fourth night in a row? What is their mood going to be? How is that person's personality? Not at nine 30 in the morning, bright and cheery five days in a row working 20 hour days. So it's the same when you're fundraising. It's the same when you're in a small partnership, you're launching, you think you know each other. Do your wives know each other? Do your partners know each other? Do the families get along? Do they all understand what's going, what's involved in this process? Because again, the last thing you want is is distraction. You don't want people misaligned. You don't want people to be pulling their hair out. You want to know everything that's happening, which then actually really comes through during zoom diligence calls and zoom meetings you know technology is one thing that we can talk about and you and i i think first met based on technology that you want to have excellent technology when you're out fundraising for this kind of conversation but you can see personal personality dynamics coming through on a zoom call if two partners aren't getting along if there's stress if there's tension if there's disagreement it comes through And in fact, it might come through better via Zoom when you're looking at the screen than in an in-person meeting because you really have to direct your eyes to one person when you're in the same room. But when you've got the Brady Bunch screen and everyone's up at the same time, no one knows who you're looking at. And you can see when someone rolls their eyes or someone shakes their head or someone has body language that isn't necessarily indicative of what someone wants to see or hear. 
you know, one of the things this is making me think about in terms of, you know, celebrating the milestones, I, I think what the family, your team, LPs actually care about, not just from a conscious, but also a subconscious level, is that we all just want to be part of a journey. And I think it's a human desire to be part of a journey, to have that frequent communication, the ups and the downs, and then the right family, the right team, the right LPs want to be part of that journey. Completely agree. I mean, look, this is a family, not a family, this is a people business. Um, I mean, even the larger institutional investors really appreciate the long-term relationships that they establish. We as a firm, Kirkland, we love the emerging manager space because we love growing with the client. We love seeing them turn into the fund that has, you know, fund 13, fund 14. Uh, you know, as a former investor and as a, you know, as a former LP and as a former direct investor, you love seeing the product of your efforts, whether it's a real estate investment, you know, driving past a downtown commercial building that is in one of your portfolios. If you focus on consumer packaged goods, seeing your product that you see it invested in a store. I mean, this is fun stuff. This is why our industry is so cool. Even seeing, you know, investors or, or GPs launching coming out of the other side. So someone who used to be on the management team at a restaurant chain launching their own firm. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's tangible. It's easy to explain to people. And, you know, that's, that's what gets me excited every day. I mean, you know, having these conversations with, with entrepreneurs who want to find and help other entrepreneurs. That's why venture is, is a really fun space because, I mean, you know, most venture capitalists or the good ones, at least, really come out of management roles at startups or at companies that have grown and been all the way through the system. And they want to get their hands dirty. Equ growth equity, it's the same thing. Good buyout firms don't want to be passive investors. They want to get in there. They want to walk the floor. They want to be able to talk to everyone on the, on the, in the, in the organization to really help figure out how to improve the situation. We're going to have to do a part two of this. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground. It was last minute planning this and it has been awesome. Like there's tons of content in here. Um, and I, and I think that we need to be doing a part two of this. Um, we will get this out quickly. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, really enjoy the insights and just kind of riffing here. Um, and I think that there's a, a lot that emerging managers and, and, and anyone who's raising capital can learn from this and looking forward to, to getting it out there.